and I think that Matt Corral is legit. I think that he is someone who could have his his Heisman moment, or at the very least, for Ole Miss lore, his Bo Wallace moment. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into Monkey Knife Fight Live. I'm Dan Watkins. Joining me, as he always does throughout the college football season, is John McKenzie of rotowire.com. John, what's going on, man? Week 5, October is here. We're diving into conference play fully across the board this weekend. What, what What are you looking at here as we enter October in the college football season? It's a lovely time of year, you know, we're, we're starting to get past the, the weekends where our favorite teams are playing the FCS schools and the tune-up games. The tune-ups have happened, and, and uh, now we're really uh, diving in. You know, we got huge matchup game day this weekend in Athens uh, for a noon kick, oddly enough, but a, a matchup of two top 10 teams, Arkansas and Georgia. We got a bunch of other really good games, a, a huge, you know, kind of prove it potentially marquee game for for Cincinnati going up against Notre Dame like there's so much to like about this slate last last weekend it it was a great slate for the weird but um, I think this week is more like just mainstream like just awesome games the entire day Saturday yeah I think I think a couple months from now this is a weekend that the college football committee could be looking at back at this Saturday in particular and it's going to be uh, when it comes to decision time, who are the final four teams going to be? I mean, there is just I mean, we have virtually a playoff eliminator in the Midwest between Notre Dame and Cincinnati, which we'll get to in a little bit. But we do have a few housekeeping items and some announcements to make before we get going here. First off, I do want to tell everybody I am not Macaulay Culkin. Um, I, I don't know that uh, what the, what was up with that reference last week. Uh, But I am not Macaulay Culkin. I mean, it would have been great if I was a child movie star, but I'm not. I am here. I am hosting MKF. You do love Home Alone, though. I do love Home Alone. It's it's a top two Christmas movie for me. We'll uh, we'll talk Christmas movies later on, though. Um, (laughs) But uh, anyways, but the big MKF announcement. uh, We have slates now. John, and uh, this is how this is going to work. Basically, uh, say that like there's a big game this weekend, right? And say like Ohio State and CJ Stroud. I think they're playing. I think they're playing Rutgers. But you don't want to. You don't want to play. You want to play CJ Stroud, right? But you have no idea anything about the Rutgers quarterback. Uh, now you can play quarterbacks or players from different games in the same contest here on MKF. It's an eight by eight, hundred times your buy-in. Um, but one thing I do want to mention, though, is that these lines and contests are always subject to change. They could change at any moment here as we get going. What we're talking about here in the preview show could change by the time kickoff rolls around on Saturday. But uh, how do you, what do you what do you think about these slates, John? I love it. I think it's a it's a really fun idea and it's a good way to you know kind of get uh, you know your exposure to, to multiple different games at, at once, and you, you're kind of able to to do the pick and choose thing. You know, like a, it's a it's a sweet buffet of uh, you know, football action. What, what more could you ask for? Smorgasbord. Love it. it indeed. Absolutely, absolutely love it. And I think, Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. I think we'll have them for what each kind of kickoff slate. We'll have like an early afternoon, then a mid midday, and then a, and then a night slate. Yeah, that's correct. Even, uh, even if you really want to get wild and your Friday night is not, you know, packed with enough entertainment, you could even get in a little Friday slate. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, here we go. Friday slate. I like little, that. Little Iowa Hawkeyes and Maryland Terrapins there. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of good stuff going on. It's a big weekend. Big weekend everywhere in the college football world, including here at MKF. So, John, let's let's get right into it, man. Monster day on Saturday, and it all starts off at noon with a noon Eastern kickoff in Georgia. You got the surprise Arkansas Razorbacks taking on your Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, and let's talk about your guy, JT Daniels. Kirby Smart said this week he's dealing with a lat injury. Uh, but he's expected to play in this when he has missed one game already this season with an oblique injury. Uh, his more or less number 260.5. This Arkansas defense has been lights out to start the season. They made Zach Calzada look like a backup, just like we talked about last week. But um, Georgia's getting their tight end back. One is JT Daniels' favorite weapons. How do you like this 260.5 number for Daniels? It's a tricky one because, you know, it, Daniels's appearances this year have all been so different. You know, like the first week of the season, Clemson, you know, they, they brought the clamps down on, on Georgia's offense. Georgia's offense didn't muster a single touchdown in that game. And then Daniels, of course, looked good against South Carolina, looked good in, you know, the first half against Vanderbilt, really took care of business 
in that one. I expect Daniels to play four quarters, provided that he's he's good to go in this one. So that tends to lead me towards uh, the, the more, or I think it, he's going to at least challenge for it. Arkansas, like you said, really, really good defensively, especially against the pass. Maybe not as good against the run. And with Daniels' lat injury and Georgia's run game, it's in and of itself. Maybe Georgia tries to go with that a run game script. So I think even though I, I was teasing some optimism towards Daniels and in, in the more in this one, I'm going to settle for less uh, when it, when it comes to Daniels uh, th- this week, I think that if Georgia wins this one and I, I think they will, they are 18 and a half point favorites. Um, I think it's going to come up on the strength of the ground game and their defense, which I, I assume we will get to right now. Yeah, this is a big time defensive matchup. I mean, Arkansas has got the number three defense in the SEC. They're allowing about 144 per game. And then you got Georgia, who I believe is the number one defense in the country. Uh, complete like all across the board. Um, they're only allowing 115 pass yards to pass yards per game. KJ Jefferson, his numbers 171.5. He injured his knee in that win over Texas A&M last week, but Sam Pittman says his quarterback should be good to go. Uh, Jefferson was he's just an animal, man. I mean, you look at him and he just he does it all. He is the Razorbacks' offense pretty much. Uh, can do it both dual threat, does it both ways. How do you like this uh, this 171 number for Jefferson, who it, he might struggle in this one against Georgia, but he has shown he can hit the big play when needed? Yes, he absolutely can hit that long touchdown to, I believe, Traylon Burks last weekend. Burks is a problem in his own right. That was the first – like I, I obviously follow Traylon Burks a lot because his numbers are really eye-popping. That was the first time I really got to watch him. as a big man that, that is able to move the way that he does. So, I mean, he he's going to be a problem for Georgia secondary, but – I got to lean with with the dogs defense here. I think the dogs defense is as legit as it gets at, at this level in this day and age. Um, so of course the, the the splash play can can happen for a guy like Jefferson this weekend, but I'm betting against it. I I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that Arkansas's offense is going to struggle for all 60 minutes on Saturday. I think they're going to have a tough time. Um, so I, I I think the pass rush is going to be able to get after them. And it's just going to be a bit of a sloppy day on the offensive side for the Hogs. So I will take the less on this one as well. So uh, I'm thinking this one's going to be very much a defensive battle. I like that. And another thing you got to remember as well, Arkansas runs the team more than any other SEC team. And K.J. Jefferson's a big part of that with those Mm -hmm. running backs. So I think it's going to be a heavy, heavy run game in this one as well. But I do just want I know we don't do we don't do spreads or, you know, picks or anything like that on this show. But I do want to get your how do you feel that Arkansas is a huge underdog and they've you know, they've been playing some lights out football. How do you feel about the Arkansas team just overall? I think they're really good. It's just I think that they are. There's a clear notch below or below or between Georgia and Arkansas. I think Arkansas, you know, Chad Morris actually like left a rel- relatively full cupboard as far as like a lot of these guys that are stars for Arkansas right now were recruits for Chad Morris. Um, so, I mean, there, there's still room for this program to, to continue to improve under Sam Pittman. He's making the most out of these guys. Um, I think that the, the future is super bright there. Obviously, the division's always going to be a, a tough slog, but getting the win over AM, I think, is a, is a big. Uh, jumping off point for them so I think they're a really really good team I think they're trending absolutely in the right direction they definitely have their guy of the future uh, in Pittman as the coach so it's all trending up for Arkansas we we could see you know some of the best years of Arkansas football you know we, we could go back to like Houston Nutt Darren McFadden levels here not too long from now but um, I, I think when it comes to this Saturday there will be a little bit of a reality check though yeah Felix Jones was that his name too was that the That's other right one? Right. Let's yes. over some Arkansas names there. Uh, and anyways, moving on. I'm glad you brought up the SEC West because a absolute hell of a matchup at 3:30 uh, Eastern Time on the uh, on CBS. You got Ole Miss, number 11 in the country, taking on Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Lane Kiffin making his return to take on Nick Saban and the Crimson Tide. The uh, over under uh, in this one. We normally don't mention these, but I'm going to mention that in this one. It's 79 and a half. And that's uh that's 30 points less than what these two teams totaled for last year. They put up a combined 111 and 11 points in a rain soaked game last year in Old Miss. Uh, this the forecast for Saturday is mid 80s and sunny in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So this should be an absolute hell of a game between these two offenses. And you have the number one and the number two favorite right now uh, for the Heisman Trophy in Matt Corral and Bryce Young. But let's talk about Bryce Young. Uh, 269 and a half. He's hit that number just uh, – no, he's hit it twice. Two out of four times so far this uh, this season. Most recently last weekend, finishing for 
with 313 yards, 20 of 22 on completions. Uh, this old deep miss defense been a little better than advertised, but Bryce Young and all of his weapons, what do you think about Bryce Young this weekend? I think that just by virtue of Ole Miss being able to keep the pressure on Bama, the, the question with Bama is always like how long, how hard do they have to play and for how long uh, until they can kind of bring in their second team and, and you know, coast it uh, into a victory. I think Bryce Young's going to have to play a four quarter game here. And I think Ole Miss is going to keep the pressure on uh, Bama to be throwing the ball. I don't think Bama has a stable of running backs like we've seen in years past that, that they can lean on and play bully ball with necessarily. So it's going to be the Bryce Young show. I, I'm full, I'm a full believer in that 269 and a half passing yards. I think if he's, if he's throwing more than 30 pass attempts, which I believe he will in this contest, the more is, is absolutely in play for me. So I, I will take the more I'm, I'm completely buying into this game uh, being the high scoring shootout that, that everyone else thinks it is. So I'm with the public on this one. I, it's, it's just going to be offensive fireworks all Saturday afternoon. I can like hear the CBS music in my ears um, as I think about this. Now I'm wondering too, I, I do think Bryce Young is going to hit the more on the passing. I'm wondering what he's going to do in the run, in the run game as well. Malik Cunningham ran for 79 yards and two touchdowns against this Ole Miss defense in week one. I want to, I want to see what Bryce Young can do here as well. I, you know, improve it if he can be that dual threat guy, which a lot of people think he can be. Uh, but this Ole Miss defense is getting better. They're allowing just 345 yards a game this year compared to over 500 last year. So something to worry. Do you think this could be a slow start for Alabama before they finally get going? Uh, that That's definitely an, an interesting angle. It, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. And, and like you said, I think that Ole Miss, their, their defense, completely different from, from where it was a year ago where, you know, uh, you would completely load up against them knowing that their defense was going to give up a ton of yards. And obviously, you know, the offense did great against Alabama last year, but the, the defense was, was completely shredded by, by them as well. Um, so I do believe that Alabama will still be able to get off to a good enough start in this one. It, it might not be uh, that opening drive, like four plays, 80 yards, boom, Bama's on the, on the scoreboard. But I, I think that they will be able to, um, to, to get things rolling. I, I'm not too worried about them uh, holding up their end of the bargain as this game pushes for that uh, 79 and a half total. And then on the other side, if you, if you don't know his name by now, I think Saturday is going to be the, the day that he becomes a household name. And that's Matt Corral. Uh, 320.5 is his more or less. The Rebels offense averaging almost 60 points a game so far through uh, three weeks three, or three games for them. And they're averaging about 635 yards a game of total offense. And Matt Corral is the reason for that. He just does it all, man. Uh, four touchdown passes of over 40 yards this year. You know Lane Kiffin and his quarterbacks, they can light it up at any point in time. He threw for 365 yards against Bama last year, and now he's back again. Matt Corral, I, uh, I text, I have a buddy that went to Ole Miss. He's an Ole Miss alum. And I texted him. I go, is this kid legit? Is he the real deal? All he sent back was Heisman, baby. So I, <laughs> uh, how do you feel about Matt Corral this weekend? I'm in. Uh, I think that this isn't uh, necessarily a world beamer beater of a, of a Bama defense. And I think that Matt Corral is legit. I think that he is someone who could have his, his Heisman moment or at the very least for Ole Miss lore, his Bo Wallace moment and beat Alabama this weekend, maybe. So we'll, we'll have to see about that one. But when it comes to uh, the 320 and a half passing yards, I'm in. Uh, I'm on the more for, for this one. I, I think that he's someone that, you know, he's such a key part of that Ole Miss offense. They, they trust him so much. And he's got such talented receivers around him to where, um, you know, he's going to be dropping back a ton. And he's going to be throwing it a ton. And I think he's going to be really effective with those throws. So, um, you know, th this will be one of those games that, that makes Nick Saban unbelievably angry because he, his team is just giving up so many yards. I love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I found this little nugget. Uh, so Matt Corral hasn't turned the ball over yet this year. No picks, which is much better than he was last year. The last team to throw an interception and beat Alabama during the regular season was LSU in 2011. So it's been 10. I think they're overdue, even if Matt Corral does have a turnover on Saturday uh, for, for, for maybe an That's upset. a crazy stat. We've seen Ole Miss shock Alabama in the past, too, wasn't it? It was a three or four years ago that they were the team that just uh, that beat Alabama like 48-45 or something the, like that? The, yes, the, there's the Chad Kelly game. I think they beat them two years in a row because I think Bo, Bo Wallace beat them the, the year before when like the state of Mississippi was the center of the college football universe for, for a little bit. That's right. Uh, Dak Prescott's, I think his junior year or something like that. And, and Bo Wallace. Um, yeah. So that was, yeah, a few years back now, but um, yeah, Ole Miss has definitely been like a memorable thorn in, in Saban's side. 
Love it. Absolutely love it. Let's move on now. Let's talk about that Midwest showdown going on in South Bend, Indiana on Saturday. This is a 2.30 Eastern time kickoff. Number seven, Cincinnati at number nine, Notre Dame. Virtually, this is a playoff eliminator. Uh, these are the best teams remaining on both of these teams' schedules. Uh, in Cincinnati, uh, some are saying this is the biggest game in school history, <laughs> and it very well could be. Uh, so Jack Cohn for the Irish, 235 and a half. He obviously finished way below that against Wisconsin. He left the game. Uh, Drew Pine came in, and as Twitter pointed out, Notre Dame does have quarterbacks named Pine and Cohn. So <laughs> take that. Twitter, as Twitter was quick to that one. Yeah. So not bad. Uh, the Irish and their quarterback, Jack Cohn. I think the big question with him is health. Is he good to go? He had a soft tissue injury. He has been practicing fully, fully dressed. And Brian, Brian Kelly says, if he's healthy, he's the starting guy. Um, another problem though, with Cohn is that offensive line, 21 sacks allowed through four, uh, four games. They rank rank 129th out of 130 eligible teams. And the, the Notre your name line has been terrible, but luckily for them, Cincinnati doesn't really rush the passer too much. Only four sacks in three games for the Bearcats. Um, Jack Cohn is, and, and my big problem with Jack Cohn is he just seems to go down right away. You saw anytime Wisconsin got like within an arm, arm length of him, he just dropped. So this number I'm a little hesitant with. How do you feel about the 235 and a half? Yeah, this was tricky because I, I don't want to paint myself as – the, the guy that believes in Jack Cohn necessarily, but no that is a low, no, that is a low number. And I think, you know, this is a game where Cincinnati is going to be able to, to hang with Notre Dame and, and, you know, potentially be leading. And I, I think that Notre Dame, they have the pass catchers. Like it's not just Michael Meyer, it, you know, Kevin Austin, I think is a really talented guy as well. So I think that there's just enough around Cohn to help kind of push him over, over this number. So I will take the more, on 235 and a half for Cone. I, I understand where that could look, end up looking bad. Obviously, last weekend, you know, he ends up uh, leaving the game. He threw for like 150 or so before, in the first half. So he was on his way to, to hitting that uh, more a week ago. I think he can do something similar that this week, even if Cincinnati is really good against the pass. Yeah, it all comes down to that offensive line with Notre yes. Dame. We've, we've seen it, like as I mentioned, uh, against Florida State, Cone had plenty of time to sit in the pocket and throw, and he threw for 366 yards. Since then, teams have been blitzing them heavy, but luckily for the Irish, it looks like Cincinnati's not going to rush the pass or too crazy. They're more going to sit back in coverage. On the other side, you got Desmond Ritter, who is like, I think he's like third or fourth right now when it comes to odds to win the Heisman. 268 and a half for Ritter is his number. Uh, so, a little interesting thing here about Ritter. Cincinnati quarterback Ritter said that his uh, offensive coordinator warned him about how loud Notre Dame can get. And um, Ritter's response was, I told him it won't be loud for too long. So he's going to try to make sure those echoes stay asleep in South Bend. How do you feel about Ritter? Oh, that, that was electric right there. But um, uh, as far as, as um, Ritter is, is concerned, I, don't, I, I hate to be the buzzkill. I hate to like be like the guy that, that's on the side of, of establishment and the side that, that thinks Notre Dame is going to win this one. But I just kind of think that they will. I think that Ritter, you know, his game against Indiana a couple weeks ago was pretty shaky. I mean, 210 yards on 36 attempts against Indiana. And that was, you know, a, a hostile environment, quote unquote. It was on the road in Bloomington. He was not impressive in that one, Cincinnati. I think is clearly the better team than, than Indiana, but it took them a long time to show it. Um, this is a huge game for them, and I'm not convinced that they're going to deliver, unfortunately. So I'm going to go with the less on Ritter. I think that that, that one um, feels like a pretty strong lean, actually, for, for me, that he's going to um, end up with less than two, 268.5. Put it in the books. John is team echoes. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm going with less as well. Uh, this just has all the, the makings of a huge letdown for Cincinnati. As we talked about, this might be the biggest game in school history. They're coming off a bye. Ritter's kind of running his mouth. And then on the Notre Dame side, their defensive coordinator, Marcus Freeman, was the Cincinnati defensive That's coordinator right. for three, the last three years. So he's gone against Ritter in practice every day for three years. So I think he might know how to stop this guy. And as you mentioned, if he's going to struggle in Indiana against the Hoosiers, He's going to struggle in Indiana against the Irish too. So I'm going less on that one. And then last up uh, for at least for the games we're talking about, we got a big 12 showdown Saturday night, number 21 Baylor, number 19 Oklahoma state. Uh, normally when you think big 12 shootout, you're thinking, Oh yeah. High flying passing offense. But you look at these two offenses, 
and they kind of want to run the ball a little more. But let's talk about Gary Bohannon from Baylor, 227 and a half is his more or less number. Shocked Iowa State last week, and uh, the Baylor Bears did, and he was a big reason for that. Um, when I when I look at Bohannon's numbers and watch him, I just think efficient. I mean, his 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 completion percentage is like around 77 percent, I think 78 percent in Big 12 games so far this season. Uh, they beat both Kansas and Iowa State. So Baylor, now they find themselves ranked number 21 after what a mess Art Biles left in that program just a couple of years ago. So they're back. How do you feel about Bohannon this week? Yeah, he's he's definitely off to a, a strong start that this year. Um, I just oddly like the Big 12 is so inverted it feels like that this season with like the strong like I never thought I would hear myself say like oh you got to worry about Oklahoma State's defense but you do like that they, they are a legitimate bunch that they, they held Boise State in check a couple of weeks ago so Baylor that they, their you know tendency to keep things on the ground now obviously a lot different than, than when it was you know in their kind of golden age a few years back I think that this ends up being, a, like you said, an efficient game from Bohannon, but not a prolific game. I think this one ends up being less than 225. I think that he ends up, or 227. Um, I think he ends up with, with way more total yards. He could even push for 300 total yards, but I think it would look a little bit closer to like 215 passing yards and, and 85 rush yards, that, that type of thing. So I, I think that uh, when it comes to just looking at his passing numbers, I'm, I'm inclined to go less. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going less as well. Uh, the Baylor rushing attack, they have the sixth best rushing attack in the country. They're averaging about 270 a game. They have three running backs with over 100, 150 yards so far through four games this season. And then Bohannon himself has over 100 yards rushing. So I think Baylor's going to try to run the ball down Oklahoma State's throat. And then you got Spencer Sanders on the other, other side, 221 and a half is his number. Baylor's pass defense, I feel like, is sneaky good, and they can be run on. And a big reason that I think Oklahoma State's going to try to do that is because of their running back, Jalen Warren, who uh, exploded for 218 yards and two touchdowns on 32 carries against Boise State. I could see a very similar game plan for the Cowboys this weekend against Baylor. How do you feel about Spencer Sanders and that 221 number? Yeah, I mean, Sanders, you know, he comes out last week and um, the, the, the game kind of funnels it towards Kansas State. Uh, their passing defense, not very good. So with that, uh, Sanders had a, a lot of success, you know, he threw for 344 yards. So I think that might make people inclined to think that, that 221 is too low, but I actually think that that is pretty reasonable. I think that his previous games uh, this season against Boise state and Tulsa, both are a little bit more indicative of, of what Oklahoma state can do on offense and what he's capable of. I think that Sanders the blooms off the rose a little bit. I, I really thought that he was going to be a, a total stud uh, for the, for the pokes, but he's, he's fine. He's not great. I don't think they, they have that classic stud Oklahoma state receiver either right now. Um, so I'm inclined to go with less for, for him as well. So a, a big 12 defensive battle that, that I'm, uh, I'm expecting here, but it, oddly enough to say, but um, you know, Dave Aranda, he knows what he's doing uh, with, with his defenders and I think that they're going to struggle through the air Oklahoma State is on Saturday. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. If it's if it's the Big 12s kind of shifting into, you know, more of a balanced conference with, a you know, with some good defenses now, or if the offenses just aren't as good as they've been in year, years past. Because we saw that uh, that Oklahoma-West Virginia game last week finishing 16 to 13 was just a, a mind boggling. I like, I like didn't even know what I was watching. I'm like sitting on my couch. Just, who are these imposters? Right. Just very, very, very strange times in the Big 12, which might just be a completely different conference in just a few years from now. And I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned Wake Forest because that's a game that this weekend that I have my eye, eye on. And, uh, Louisville and Wake Forest, the ACC is oh, wide yeah. open and it's, yes. it's, it's up for the taking. And these two teams could very well be vying for that ACC title this year. Um, I love the over the more 241 and a half for Malik Cunningham. As you mentioned, Brennan Armstrong threw for over 400 yards on Wake Forest last week and they only scored 17 points. So I, I think Malik Cunningham can have a very good game. He's been very solid all year. Uh, just he's been hovering right right above that 241 line the entire the entire season so far. He's hit more more in three of four games. And then on the other side, I'm going to go less with Sam Hartman on the 257 and a half. How is this guy still a sophomore? You look at his at his uh, his uh, football reference page. He's got four seasons under his belt, and this will be the fourth time he's playing Louisville, <laughs> and he's still a sophomore. I think he was in Jake Fromm's recruiting class. Like that's how long he's been around. 
Jake Fromm. Great. I love it. Yeah. So he's played three games in the past against Louisville. He's never had more than 225 passing yards. So I think that continues. I'm going less 257 and a half on him. Um, and Louisville has been much better since Matt Corral hung uh, 380 on him in week one. And then yes. another guy I'm looking at tonight. Uh, and then later on, you got uh, Indiana, uh, Penn State in that 7:30 ABC kickoff. I'm going with Sean Clifford to go more 242 and a half against Indiana at home. Clifford showed he can throw it when he needs to, and I think they're going to need to against this Indiana defense. And then the last guy I'm, I like that I just like picking on, uh, I'm going less than 207.5 for Bo Nix against LSU. I think he's going <laughs> to struggle against the Tigers. He had a terrible game against Georgia State last week. So I think the Tigers are going to have some – their LSU Tigers are going to have something in store for him Saturday night. I, I love that Knicks call. I mean, it, and, uh, you know, the, the, take you down narrative street a little bit, you know, TJ Finley going back to, to his former school that he was starting at this time a year ago. I think the leash is really, really short um, when, it, when it comes to Bo Nix. I, I was talking to uh, the uh, sports talk company 97.7 in, in Louisiana this week, and, and one of the hosts is a big Auburn guy, and he's just talking about how – Parson is just really almost cleaning house. Like, you know, they already fired their uh, receivers coach. Uh, they pulled, you know, the golden boy, Bo Nix. Like he, he does not care. He just wants to win at, at all costs and he doesn't care whose feelings get hurt. So if Bo Nix is hurting them on the field, his, his feelings are going to get hurt and he's going to get pulled. Yeah. And TJ Finley came in last week and moved the ball with ease against exactly. Jordan State, which shouldn't be a problem, but it was a problem for Bo Nix. So uh, I think that's going to do it for us this week. Enjoy this massive monster slate of college football on Saturday and some good Friday night games as well if you're taking in those. And uh, check out our slate options that we have now. Those 8x8s look like a lot of fun. John, where can they follow you? You can find me on Twitter at John's underscore tailgate, and you can find my work over at rotowire.com slash cfootball, all, all the college football content that we have over there. Love it. And you can follow me at Dan Watkins Radio on Twitter. And once again, I am not Macaulay Culkin. So. Mm-hmm.